This is the story of one of the most tragic incidents in aviation history. Of how a jumbo jet goes berserk, plunging up and down at 7,300 meters. Of how an innocent mistake made years earlier puts over 500 lives at risk and how investigators literally stumble on the reason behind the biggest single air crash in history. Japan Airlines Flight 123 is uncontrollable. Next. may be the last video ever taken of Japan Airlines Flight 123. It's late summer and millions are traveling home for a traditional Japanese holiday. Something exploded. Japan Air 123 request. The plane is only 12 minutes into its flight when terror strikes. It's out of control, plunging up and down hundreds of meters at a time. And it's headed straight into the mountains that surround Mount Fuji, the tallest mountain in Japan. On the ground, Japan Airlines staff search frantically for the cause of the problem. In Tokyo, air traffic controllers try to guide the plane to safety, while the pilots resort to desperate measures to keep the plane aloft. Tokyo, Japan, August the 12th, 1985. In most of Japan, it's the eve of Obon, when people traditionally honor their ancestors, often returning to their place of birth for family reunions. Tokyo's Haneda Airport is crowded, with thousands trying to get home. On the tarmac, jumbo jets are lining up. Air travel is so popular here that Japan Airlines has to use 747s even for its short internal flights. Tokyo Area Control handles all aircraft over central Japan, including those on their way to and from the city's two big airports, Haneda and Narita. It's six o'clock in the evening, but the rush won't be over for hours. Crowded passenger lists and busy controllers make it a typical holiday weekend. Roger, approved as your request. Cathay 456, turn right on heading 250, climb and maintain flight level 240. At Haneda Airport, Japan Airlines Flight 123 is boarding. Among the passengers is young Yumi Ochiai. She's actually a flight attendant for Japan Airlines, but today she's off duty. Yumi takes a seat, four rows from the back of the plane. At 6.12 in the evening, flight 123 takes off heading for the industrial city of Osaka, 400 kilometers to the west. It's filled almost to capacity, 509 passengers and a crew of 15. Japan Air 123, contact Tokyo departure. Roger, Japan Air 123, Air 1. Captain Masami Takahama is 49 years old and one of the airline's senior training captains. On this flight, he'll be handling the radio and keeping an eye on the first officer, who's sitting in the captain's seat. Yutaka Sasaki is flying the plane. He's hoping for promotion to captain. Hiroshi Fukuda, a veteran flight engineer, is the third man on the flight deck. Tokyo departure, Japan Air, one, two, three. Passing eight, uh, 800. JAL-123's route will take it south over Enshu Bay then southwest along the coast, until finally taking a sharp right turn to land in Osaka. The flight will take 54 minutes.
Flight 123 is leaving Tokyo behind, climbing to 7,300 meters. 12 minutes into this short flight, the plane's black box shows that all is going well. Hello, pet. What's the problem? Someone wants to go to the restroom. Shall I let him? The plane's black box records a routine request from a passenger. He wants to use the bathroom before the seatbelt light is turned off. Be careful, please. An ordinary request on a routine day. Air is rushing out of the cabin. The oxygen masks drop down automatically when the air pressure falls. The explosion, the sudden loss of pressure in the cabin. There must be a hole in the aircraft. Gear door. Gear. Gear. What? Check you. You. The pilot's first thought is that the landing gear doors have blown off. Squawk 77. 7700 is the emergency code. When the crew radios this code to the ground, air traffic control will know the plane is in trouble. Every plane on the controller's screen carries a label giving the plane's identity. Suddenly, the label beneath Flight 123 changes. Someone in the cockpit has keyed in the emergency signal. The plane's crew members are baffled. They know only that there's been a loud noise, some sort of explosion, a subsequent drop in cabin pressure, and a growing loss of control. Yet their instruments offer no clues to the mystery. Engines. Oh, engines okay. Ominously, right the pilots can't right get the plane to respond. It's dropping. Right turn. Right turn. Hydraulic pressure. It's dropping. The plane's flight controls are powered by hydraulic pressure. The elevator, which makes the plane go up and down, the rudder, and ailerons, which make it turn. On a big modern jet, all these are too heavy to operate with cables and levers. Instead, they're controlled by hydraulic fluid which flows in pipes around the aircraft. It's the lifeblood of the plane. Tokyo, Japan Air, one, two, three, request immediate. Trouble. Request return back to Haneda. Mover. Roger, approved as you request. Turn right to heading 090. Put the mask on securely. Put the bag around your head like this. Don't bang so much. Yes. Crew members, please help out with the oxygen bottles. Prepare the oxygen bottles, please! Don't bang so much. Turn it back. It won't go back. Nothing seems to be working. All the controls are dead. They're 7,300 meters up in the air, traveling at nearly 540 kilometers an hour and unable to control the plane. In the growing uncertainty of the situation, the pilots know they need to get down fast. The controller is puzzled. Instead of making the anticipated 180 degree turn back to the airport, the plane now veers off its course, but not towards Haneda. No, no, ah, 123, negative, negative, negative. Please confirm that you are declaring emergency, that's right? That's affirmative. Request the nature of your emergency. Hydraulic pressure, all lost. All lost? No, look. All lost? Yes. The company, please, make a request to the company, please. You want to make a fuss? The crew seem paralyzed and don't radio the airline or answer the tower. The officials on the ground don't know that the plane has lost its hydraulic power, but their screens tell them it's flying erratically and is Let's possibly descend. out of control. Right turn, descend. Look at his altitude. Up and down, up and down. But now, on control. Put your heart into it or it's stop. The hydraulics failure has caused a serious problem. For the last few minutes, the plane has begun flying in an alarming pattern. First, it climbs steeply, then tips over and goes into a terrifying dive of 1,200 meters, only to level off and begin to climb again. This repeats itself over and over again. The pilots cannot understand this bizarre behavior. 
and they are powerless to stop it. Tokyo Area Control, August the 12th, 1985. The controller receives an emergency signal from a jumbo jet that left Haneda Airport 13 minutes ago. Tokyo, Japan Air 123, request immediate. Trouble. Request return back to Haneda. Move What the oxygen must In the cabin, confusion and panic spread like wildfire. There's been an explosion, and now some passengers are gasping for air. Hydraulic pressure's dropped! The plane's precious hydraulic fluid is gone. That's why the flight controls aren't working properly. Don't bang so much. Turn it back. It won't go back. Airline personnel are trained to take charge in a crisis, and passenger Yumi Ochiai helps out even though off duty. At Tokyo Control, the controller is now joined by his supervisor. Who's that? JAL 123, he's declared an emergency. He says it's uncontrollable. He says he wants to go back to Haneda, but his heading is all wrong. He can't seem to turn. Get him to Nagoya. That'll be the easiest. It's a straight line. The best solution would be for the plane to switch course to Nagoya Airport, which is 128 kilometers straight ahead. But they'd need to start descending immediately if they're going to land there. Right, your position 72, 72 miles to Nagoya. Can you land at Nagoya? Negative. Request back to Haneda. It's a wrong runway. The captain wants to try to get back to Haneda. It's a large airport and ideally suited for a jumbo 747 in an emergency. But it's in the opposite direction. If he can get it down. Uh, 123, can you descend? Roger, but the black box shows that he doesn't descend. Without control of the aircraft, they can't. In the thin atmosphere at this altitude, the passengers are finding it difficult to breathe. People without oxygen masks may soon become unconscious. The situation worsens as some of the masks at the back of the plane run out of oxygen. It's been five minutes since the explosion, and a flight attendant is finally able to call the cockpit with news about what's happened to the plane. Yes, what is it? The flight attendant tells the engineer that the explosion has occurred in the rear of the plane and may have come from the baggage compartment. So, the baggage compartment further in the rear. Listen, right now the baggage compartment right at the back has collapsed. Uh, I think we'd better descend. They need to get down quickly before the passengers become unconscious. But the captain seems to be struck by a strange paralysis. All the passengers are using their masks. Shall we descend a little? The captain does not reply. It's possible that by now he and his crew are suffering from hypoxia or lack of oxygen to the brain. The R5 pet? At this altitude, the oxygen in their blood starts to fall. First, their judgment may become impaired. Eventually, they may lose consciousness. The R5 pet? Yes, I understand. Captain, the R5 massive, stop! At the R5 door, the situation is becoming critical. The oxygen supply has failed. The cabin crew have to give the passengers whiffs of oxygen from a gas bottle. Still, the captain and his crew seem to be drowning in confusion. I think we better make an emergency descent. Yes. <clears throat> Shall we use our mask too? We better. I think we better use the oxygen mask. Yes. But they don't put on their masks. No one knows why. It might be indecision or hypoxia beginning to cloud their judgment. At Japan Airlines in Tokyo, flight operations have been alerted to the emergency, but are as mystified as everyone else on the ground. All they know is that over 500 lives are at stake. 
It's their job to try to diagnose the problem and come up with a solution while the plane is in the air. This is Japan Air Tokyo. Tokyo Control said they received an emergency call from you. And Listen, right now the R5 door has broken. Uh, Roger, is the captain returning to Tokyo? What? Can you return to Haneda? Uh, uh, just a moment. Uh, we are making an emergency descent. Uh, we'll contact you again in a little while. Uh, keep monitoring us, please. Uh, Roger. R5 door. Could it have come off? If the door has come off, that could mean an explosive decompression of the cabin as the air rushes out. Passengers may have been sucked out kilometers above the ground. But there's a worse possibility. If the door hit the tail of the aircraft, it could have damaged it. The tail keeps the plane stable. Its rudder and elevators make the plane go up and down or side to side. If the tail is damaged, flight operations will be powerless to assist them. In Tokyo, news that a Japan Airlines jumbo jet is in trouble has leaked almost immediately. Japanese television is already breaking into regular programming with live interviews. Someone saw the crippled jet fly overhead. I knew the plane was in trouble, he is saying. It was swaying back and forth. Then it disappeared in a cloud. Flight 123's meandering route has put it in range of an American Air Force base at Yokota on the northern outskirts of Tokyo. An American controller there has overheard the conversations between the plane and Tokyo Air Traffic Control. He wants to help to offer Yokota runway for landing. Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, Yokota approach. If you hear me, contact Yokota. Pilots are preoccupied and don't respond. Since they've lost all normal control of the plane, they're now testing the throttles to see what happens. They can make the plane go faster or slower. At least they have speed at their command. As they experiment, they find that if they push the throttles forward when the plane is diving, making the engines go faster, it actually makes the plane come out of the dive and brings the nose up. And if they pull back the throttles when it's climbing, slowing the engines, the nose tips and begins to dive. These actions are the opposite of what a pilot would normally do, but it seems to work, and they begin to flatten out the mad roller coaster ride. Then a second experiment. By applying more thrust to the engines on the left side of the aircraft, they manage to slowly turn the plane right in the general direction of Tokyo. But then their luck runs out. In the frantic juggling of throttles, the pilots get out of step. It drives the 747 into a frenzy. Both hands. How about gear down? Gear down! Should we put the gear down? Lowering the landing gear should slow the plane down and make it more stable. Doesn't work. Should I lower the alternate? For safety, 747s employ an electrically run system, separate from the hydraulics, that can lower the landing gear in an emergency. While the engines are turning, they still have electric power. Lowering the landing gear helps stabilize the plane. The drag of the undercarriage has a dampening effect on the pitching motion. But it also destroys the directional control they were getting by applying more power to one side of the aircraft. Max power. Close to Mount Fuji, the tallest mountain in Japan, the plane makes an abrupt turn to the right and begins a terrifying dive. The plane is falling at 900 meters a minute, twice the normal rate of descent. We're going down. Heavy. Put the wheel all the way. All the way. It's all the way. Not heavy. Get the gear down. There is no need for alarm. The, the plane's black box records the flight attendant still trying to calm the passengers. Japan Air 123, uncontrollable. Right, he's going to hit the mountain. Tokyo control, Tokyo control, Canadia, sir. This is. All station, all station except the Japan Air 123, keep silent until further advised. Uncontrollable. Understood. Do you wish to contact... Stay with us, please. Stay with us. 
just as suddenly the plane comes out of its dive. They've dropped over 3,000 meters. They're now in amongst towering mountains, but at least there's more oxygen at this altitude. The pilots have been fighting the plane for an intense 22 minutes since the explosion. This may be hopeless. The hydraulic fluid is all gone. It's uncontrollable. Hey, mountain, come, come, right, come, right, come, right, 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 Applying maximum power in order to lift the nose is their only option. In their efforts to control the plane, they've allowed the speed to drop too much. To escape the mountain, they need maximum power to generate more speed and more lift. Stick with it! Stick with it! Huh. It's pushed out the way! Huh. We're losing altitude! Huh. Go lower the nose! Huh. It's lowering! We're going down! Huh. The passengers grasp the seriousness of the situation. Many of them prepare for the end. But increasing power to avoid the mountains has caused the plane to resume its wayward up and down motions. Having run out of options, the crew is forced to repeat the same futile procedures over and over. They've been fighting the plane for nearly 30 minutes now. Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, Yokota. The air traffic controllers, Japanese and American, are desperate to help, to give Flight 123 any information or reassurance they can. Request a radar vector to Haneda. Roger, understood. Keep heading 090. Zero, but frustratingly, the plane continues heading off to the northwest, away from both Haneda Airport and Yokota Air Base. Now, with every rise and fall of the plane, they're barely above the mountaintops. Can you control the aircraft now? An ominous silence descends on area control. Japan Air 123, switch your radio frequency to 119.7. 119.7, please. They try changing radio frequency. If you can, change the frequency to 119.7. There is no reply. If you read, come up on 119.7, we are all ready. Your position, five, uh, four or five miles northwest of Haneda. In the tensions of the moment, the controller is a bit confused and mistakes the plane's distance from Haneda. Northwest of Haneda? How many miles? Yes, that is correct. On our radar, you are 55, five, five miles northwest. We are ready for your approach at any time. Yokota is also available for landing. Let us know your intentions. Over. At Haneda Airport, emergency services are being mobilized for the plane, wherever it can touch down. Yes, watch. Oh, ah. They say we're 25 miles west of Kumagaya. Suddenly, the plane goes into a steep dive, the worst yet. Stop the flap. Ah. Power! Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! Power! The plane is falling at 5,500 meters a minute. Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, can you hear me? 
Japan Air 123, Japan Air 123, do you read? Japan Air 123. Japan Air 123. Japan Air 123 is gone. At Tokyo Control, they've lost contact with a Japan Airlines jumbo jet full of passengers. An American plane flying in the area has been listening in to the drama of Flight 123 and reports seeing flames in the mountains some hundred kilometers west of Tokyo. One of the C-130 pilots later said that they even guided a rescue helicopter to the scene and American Marines stood by, ready to rappel down to the burning wreckage. But before they could do so, they were ordered to return to base. Rivalry between the various Japanese emergency forces is reported to have caused confusion and delays as the victims of the crash wait for help. During the night, the Japanese self-defense force arrives on the scene. A helicopter flown by Captain Isuzu Omori finds the crash site. The pilot radios in. Minokayama, Victor 107. I see something. I see flames in about 10 spots over an area of about 300 meters square. Victor 107, Minokayama, is there any sign of survivors? Victor 107, no signs of survivors. Visibility poor, too much smoke. Victor 107, can you land to investigate? Not a chance. It's a 45 degree slope down there. Nowhere to put down. And there's fire everywhere. Seeing no sign of survivors and unwilling to risk a landing at night, Captain Omori returns to base. Meanwhile, a team of rescuers is on its way by road. But since they don't expect to find anyone alive, they spend the night in a village 68 kilometers from the crash site. At the crash site, the passengers of Flight 123 lie dying. The next morning, the last moments of Flight 123 start to become clear. The 747 sliced a path through the trees near the top of Mount Osutaka, one of the mountains north of Mount Fuji. The plane finally hit a ridge several hundred meters further on and exploded. The wreckage and passengers then tumbled down the steep side of the mountain. It's now 14 hours after the crash, and the Japanese Self-Defense Force rescue team arrives at the scene. They are confronted with the worst single aircraft accident in history. find a survivor. It's the off-duty flight attendant, Yumi Ochiai, still hanging on to life. And she is not the only one. Rescuers find a 12-year-old girl wedged in the branches of a tree and airlift her to safety. Incredibly, two more passengers are alive, a young mother and her eight-year-old daughter. It's nothing short of a miracle. But how have these four survived? 
the human body is believed to be able to stand a forward deceleration of up to 25 times the force of gravity. But investigators report that from the speed at which the aircraft hit the ground, those at the front of the plane experienced a sudden stop of over 100 Gs. The four survivors are hurried to a hospital in Fujioka city. Investigators will soon discover that all four of the surviving passengers were seated in the last seven rows. This is how they survived. In the back of the 747, the impact forces were much less. Sheer luck had protected them from the flying debris. Yumi Ochiai has a broken pelvis and a fractured arm. She tells a disturbing story of what happened as she lay on the mountain, awaiting rescue, and that many more passengers survived the crash. After the crash, I heard harsh panting and gasping noises from many people. I heard it coming from everywhere, all around me. There was a boy crying, Mother. I clearly heard a young woman saying, Come quickly. Suddenly, I heard a boy's voice. OK, I'll hang on, he said. It sounded like the voice of a boy of about school age. In the darkness, I could hear the sound of a helicopter. I couldn't see any light, but I could hear the sound, and it was quite near too. We'll be saved, I thought, and waved frantically. But the helicopter went further away. Don't go, I waved desperately. Help, but it faded. I could no longer hear the voices of the boy or the young woman. It's clear now that many died in the cold night air, waiting for rescue. The crash of this jumbo jet would normally be a strictly Japanese affair, but it sets aviation alarm bells ringing around the world. Only weeks earlier, an Air India 747 had gone down in the Atlantic, killing 329 people. Now another 520 dead. Was there something wrong with the 747, the world's biggest jet? Could there be some unknown design fault? There were some 600 747s flying worldwide. A problem with the plane would have grave consequences for aviation. Ron Schleed, a top investigator with America's National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, was assigned the case. So it was very big concern on our part uh, about whether there was a problem with the 747, an airworthiness problem. And so we had to jump on this uh, very quickly to learn what happened. At the Washington headquarters of the NTSB, the chairman was extremely concerned of the potential consequences for world aviation. He wrote a personal note to his opposite number in Japan, begging him to invite the NTSB to join the investigation as guests. During the late 70s and 80s, Ron Schleed was involved with many of the major foreign investigations for the NTSB. He's familiar with the sensitivities of working with foreign governments and heads to Tokyo where he'll meet the rest of his team, representatives from Boeing, the plane's manufacturer, and an engineer from America's Federal Aviation Administration. When I arrived in Tokyo, the atmosphere in Japan was uh, extremely stressful. The news media were everywhere. There was a tremendous amount of anger. Once in Japan, Schleed found that the local Japanese police had taken over the investigation and were treating it like a crime scene, diligently observing his team's every move. Everyone was, was considered suspicious. Japanese airline personnel, Boeing personnel, were considered suspicious. They weren't even allowed to go to the accident site. Schleed had to wait for two days before the Japanese authorities would allow him to visit the site. I was able to convince the Japanese to allow us to take Boeing people to the site with the stipulation that the Boeing people stick, stuck very close to us and uh, we supervised them while they were on scene. They could not operate on their own. 
Schlied found that to gain access to the site, the Japanese had quickly constructed helicopter landing pads. It was an amazing sight to look up at this mountain and see what looked like wreckage from an airplane at a distance, but you could not recognize any part of an airplane. There were scores of helicopters in the air landing and taking off every couple minutes. Amidst the wreckage of JAL-123, Schlied found that some families of the victims had managed to scramble to the remote mountain site on foot and build shrines to their loved ones. From above, flowers rained down on the investigators. I recall these big white, I believe they were Chinook helicopters, flying over and uh, there were families aboard the helicopters looking at the accident site. They were quite high and they were dropping flowers, flower petals down onto the accident site. The one thing that we found uh, when we got to the accident site was that many of the passengers had a lot of time to think about the end. And uh, they found many, many notes written on pieces of paper, anything they could get their hands on. My darling wife, life with you has been wonderful. Our children have grown up to be people I am proud of. I never dreamed that the dinner we had last night would be our last together. Passengers were able to think and realize that they were out of control and maybe going to crash, so they wrote notes to their loved ones and left them in the back of the seats or in their pockets. But what could have caused this disaster? Neither the heart-rending letters nor the tangled wreckage yet yield any answer to what happened to Flight 123. Still, the main thing the investigators have to go on are the words on the plane's cockpit voice recorder, those of the plane's flight engineer who had said that door R5 was broken. They believe that the door has somehow come off in flight, crashed into the tail, and damaged the plane's flying surfaces. The horizontal stabilizer, which makes the plane go up and down, the rudder, which controls side-to-side -side movement. But then, a piece of news that destroys that theory totally. The door had not come off. It's found by the investigators amidst the wreckage. The flight engineer was wrong. Ah, uh, right now the R5 door has broken. The warning light on his panel led him to believe that the door had failed in flight. But the alarm may well have been set off by a short circuit in the electrical system, caused by the ceiling collapsing in the explosion. It was not a broken door that caused Flight 123 to crash. The investigators would have to look elsewhere. Stop the flap! Power! 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 Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! Flap up! It's up! Japan Airlines Flight 123 has crashed into Mount Osutaka, taking hundreds of lives. Investigators are worried about a hidden fault in the Boeing 747. They need to find the cause of this crash quickly. A photograph taken by an amateur photographer provides the first clue to the mystery of why the plane became unflyable. There's something odd about the image. Photographic technicians put it on a computer and work hard to enhance the photograph to sharpen up its blurred lines. Finally, they get a clear enough picture. The whole huge tail fin of the airplane is missing. It's what keeps the plane steady. Since most of the plane's hydraulic fluid lines pass through the fin, it starts to make sense why they lost hydraulic pressure and control of the plane. 
Then, a Japanese Navy ship steaming across the bay south of Tokyo came upon the plane's tail fin floating on the sea. It's at the very spot where the plane had first reported an emergency. Investigators are now certain that the starting point of the accident must have something to do with the tail of the aircraft. They review the known facts. Something had caused the ceiling at the back of the plane to collapse. There had been an explosive decompression of the aircraft. Whatever it was also ripped off the tail fin and the main hydraulic lines with it, making the plane uncontrollable. This may be hopeless. The hydraulic fluid is all gone. At last. Explosion, decompression, loss of the tail fin and hydraulic failure. The investigators need to find out what links these four elements together. Routinely, the investigators begin by looking back into the plane's history. And they make an intriguing discovery. The plane had been in another accident seven years earlier. The pilot landed the plane with its nose too high. The tail struck the ground and scraped along the runway. There had been a repair to the rear part of the airplane, including the rear pressure bulkhead. Well, all modern jets, uh, aircraft, when they climb, they have to be pressurized to keep the cabin to a reasonable level for the passengers. So let's take a 747. When the 747 is on the ground, it's actually somewhat oval-shaped. And as it climbs and pressurizes, it becomes more circular. The rear pressure bulkhead is like a huge metal umbrella lying on its side at the very back of the plane. Its purpose is to stop pressurized air escaping from the cabin out through the tail of the aircraft. It must be very, very heavy and strong because the forces are tremendous. They're over eight uh, PSI differential, very a lot of pressure. The design of a 747 aft pressure bulkhead was what they call a dome. And uh, it was uh, uh, designed to take the pressure with a lot less heavy metal. And it's a, it's a typical design. It's a pressure dome. Seven years earlier, Japan Airlines called in Boeing to repair the cracked bulkhead. Boeing engineers spliced a new panel into the damaged bulkhead. But at the accident site of Flight 123 in 1985, Ron Schleed stumbled across a piece of wreckage that unraveled the whole mystery. It was a piece of this new panel that had been spliced into the bulkhead. The repair had, in fact, not been done correctly. There was only one row of rivets holding that joint together, uh, where there should have been uh, two rows of rivets holding the joint together. To explain to the Japanese investigators what he discovered, Ron Schleed sketched out how the repair should have been made and the mistake that had been made. It was a catastrophic error. The rivets were carrying twice the force they should have been. One of the FA engineers there did some calculations for us based on this earlier repair of the bulkhead. And his theory was if the repair wasn't done correctly, for example, if they had not put the rivets in properly and they only had one row of rivets holding the bulkhead together versus two as designed, that it possibly could, it would fail prematurely. The FAA engineer calculated that the faulty repair to the bulkhead would fail after 10,000 flights. From the moment the repair was done, it was simply a matter of time. The investigators found that a simple human error had led to this. summer's evening in 1985, Japan Air 123 lifts off from Haneda Airport. It's the 12,319th takeoff since the repair of the damaged bulkhead, a repair that the investigators calculated would only hold for 10,000 flights. 
As the plane climbs to 7,300 meters, the air outside gets thinner and thinner. But the air inside the cabin is pressurized for the passenger's comfort. The difference of pressure between the passenger cabin on one side of the bulkhead and the unpressurized tail on the other stretches the bulkhead and its faulty repair to the breaking point. In a test which duplicated these conditions, cracks began to appear and lengthen around the rivet holes until the bulkhead snaps. In an instant, pressurized air from the cabin blows a hole in it two to three meters square, bringing down the ceiling around the rear toilets. The highly pressurized air blasts its way into the tail fin of the aircraft and simply blows it off. From that moment on, the plane is doomed. The pilots don't know, and will never know, that most of the tail of their aircraft is missing, blown off into the sea below along with the crucial hydraulic lines that allow them to control the plane. It all finally makes sense. Without the stabilizing influence of the tail, and with the loss of ability to control the rudder and flaps, the pilots cannot control the plane. The giant aircraft now oscillates in a terrifying motion called the fugoid cycle. As the nose drops into a shallow dive, the plane gathers speed, which generates lift. The nose rises again, and the plane begins to climb until it loses speed, tips over, and begins to fall again. The whole cycle repeats itself over and over again. Flight 123 is now plunging up and down in terrifying dives, sometimes several hundred meters at a time. It really could be considered a miracle that the pilots were able to keep the airplane flying for 30 minutes or more after having lost all the hydraulics in their flight controls. But it kept circling and eventually worked its way into the mountains, and it became impossible for them to uh, to land. There was no real alternative for them at all, uh, except to fly as long as they could and hope for some miracle, which never occurred. Lower the nose. Lower the nose. Yes. Both hands. How about gear down? Gear down. To put the gear down. To understand what the pilots were up against, four hand-picked flight crews were placed in a simulator and confronted with the same situation. Not one of them could land the plane. The pilots of Flight 123 managed to keep their plane in the air for 30 minutes, much of it among high mountains, an amazing feat of flying. Back in Tokyo, as the cause of the JAL accident was identified, Ron Schlied had to break the news to his colleague from Boeing, one of the top designers of the 747. The simple truth was that a single row of rivets had been used when a double row was required. And when we uh, described our findings to him, you can imagine this Boeing man became very, very upset. Uh, uh, personally, uh, was crying because of the fact that his airplane that he designed and then the people that did the repair, because it was Boeing people that designed and did the repair, had made an improper repair that caused the airplane to crash. The Japanese police wanted to bring criminal charges against Boeing for its part in the tragedy but the prosecutors decided not to go ahead. Boeing's reputation was damaged, but if they could derive any comfort at all from this tragedy, it was that there was no inherent fault in the 747. The plane continues on to become one of the most successful civil aircraft of all time. However, Japan Airlines, the innocent party, had no such comfort. After I left uh, the scene, and came home, it was my understanding that one of the senior Japanese Airlines uh, uh, maintenance managers actually committed suicide. The Japanese Airlines president resigned. The bookings slumped. Rumors abounded in Japan that the airline was indeed guilty and that Boeing was just taking the rap for a valuable customer. It's taken years for Japan Airlines to recover from this experience the worst single plane crash in history. In 
1998, off Canada's east coast, a modern passenger jet run by one of the world's best airlines catches fire at 33,000 feet. In its final six minutes, communications from the cockpit cease. It's burning already! Then the plane plummets into the ocean. <laughs> 229 people are dead. What caused the fire is a mystery. Many of the vessels uh, reported to the Canadian Navy vessel standing by on scene that they were finding bodies and making repeated requests uh, for more body bags and get the bodies that were Now, terrible. after one of the largest investigations in aviation history, the complete story behind the loss of Swiss Air Flight 111 can finally be told. It's a wake-up call for the entire airline industry to ensure that what happened aboard Swiss Air 111 would never happen again. This accident investigation was a unique opportunity to assess the materials in airplanes. And the problem is not only just the stuff that can burn, but the fact you can't see it. When you really have fire on board, the clock is running against you. September the 2nd, 1998. Swiss Air Flight 111 prepared to depart New York's JFK International Airport en route to Geneva, Switzerland. The aircraft was a McDonnell Douglas 11, or MD-11, a model first developed in 1986 as a highly automated, modern replacement for the antiquated DC-10. It was considered one of the most reliable passenger jets in the skies, and Swiss Air pilots were among the world's best trained. Okay, after start checklist. Um, engine anti-ice, not required. Roger, not required. Auto brakes, take off. Swiss Air 111's pilots were Captain Urs Zimmermann two, and First nine, Officer five. Stefan Löw. Swiss Air 111, hold short, 3-1 left. Zimmerman encouraged an easy-going atmosphere in the cockpit, but he was also known for his by-the-book precision. When not flying, he was an instructor of new pilots for Switzerland's national airline. Take checklist. Uh, flaps and slats. Flaps set, 15 degrees. Set at 15. On board were 215 passengers, 12 crew, and two pilots. Most were French, American, or Swiss. 23-year-old Stephanie Shaw was on her way home to her parents in Geneva. Stephanie uh, was blessed in many ways. She was uh, physically very attractive. She was an intelligent girl. She, uh, the reason she went to New York was that she had been invited to become a member of the World Economic Forum, which is based in Geneva. And she wanted to have this trip uh, before she joined. She was a darling, she, an absolute darling. 8.18 p.m. Swiss Air 111 heavy, clear for takeoff. Cleared for takeoff, Roger, Swiss Air 111. For safety, the Swiss Air pilots push the throttles forward together, ensuring no single pilot can botch a takeoff. The R, the E2. Swiss Air Flight 111 lifted off and made her way northeast toward the open Atlantic. For the first 15 minutes after takeoff, there was no communication from Swiss Air 111. It was an unusual, small detail that would later baffle investigators. Well, it does happen occasionally. They had not yet reached what we call the North Atlantic track system, where then you're not really usually in radio contact. So 
I thought it was a little abnormal, but it appears it was just nothing more than a mistaken radio frequency. When the guy dialed it in and swapped over the radio, he had put in the incorrect frequency and evidently uh, just, you know, they didn't make another attempt at contacting someone. It was strange. And uh, I agree with you. It was kind of, it's kind of like, whoa, that's, that's interesting. Atlantic air traffic is handled by a remote center in Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada. Almost half an hour after takeoff, Captain Zimmerman made his first communication with Moncton. Moncton Center, Swiss Air 111 Heavy, good uh, evening, level 330. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, Moncton Center, good evening. Reports of uh, occasional light turbulence at all levels. Moncton, Swiss Air. It was a perfectly normal transatlantic crossing. In first class, Swiss Air passengers were among the first in the world to have a personalized in-flight entertainment network. Though now common, the system was an innovation in 1998. Passengers could choose their own movie, browse the internet, and gamble. They uh, evaluated the market and they thought that introducing a modern in-flight entertainment system combined with a gambling system so that passengers actually can use their credit card and gamble during long-range flights um, would make them more attractive. This luxury would be the source of controversy to come. Smell something? Yeah, what is that? Go have a look, I'll take the controls. Roger, you have control. First Officer Love investigated the area near the air condition event. Harmless smoke traces from air conditioning systems are common on commercial jets. see anything, Urs, and there's nothing up there now. You yell for me, Captain? Stefan and I were sure we smelled smoke a few seconds ago. Can you smell anything? I smell it too, yeah. Could you smell in the cabin before you came in? No, definitely not. They agreed that the air conditioner was the likely culprit. Can't see it or smell it anymore. Air conditioning, is it? Yeah. Please close it, thanks. Behind the sealed panel, the pilots could not see that the problem was getting worse. Less than 45 seconds after smoke disappeared in the cockpit of Swiss Air 111, it returned. Zimmerman followed Swiss Air procedure. Again. He made plans to divert to the nearest place to land. Find the closest place to land, Stefan. We'll need the nav charts from the library, uh, also weather data for the area. Boston's close. It's not doing well at all up there. Zimmerman radioed air traffic control in Moncton, New Brunswick. Moncton Center, Swiss Air 111 Heavy, good evening. The United 920 Heavy, Moncton Center, good evening. The controller dealt with another Eastern aircraft before responding to Swiss Air. Other aircraft calling, say again. Swiss Air 111 Heavy is declaring pan, pan, pan. We have smoke in the cockpit. Uh, request um, uh, immediate return to a convenient place, I guess. Boston. Pan, pan, pan is an international term used to notify air traffic control of an urgent situation. 
one step below declaring May Day. You say to Boston you want to go? Uh, I guess Boston, uh, we need for some weather there. Uh, we are starting right turn here, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. Swiss Air 111, roger, and... Ascent to flight level 310. 310. 310, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. This is the first interview with one of the air traffic controllers in Moncton. My name is Bill Pickerel, and on September 1998, September 2nd, 1998, I was one of two Halifax terminal controllers uh, working the evening shift. The pan uh, in any kind of a special uh, condition is usually dealt with uh, as an emergency, and this, in fact, was dealt with that way. The aircraft was immediately given priority, and the uh, high-level supervisor initiated a call to the rescue coordination center. Pickerel's colleague determined that Swiss Air 111 was just 66 nautical miles from Halifax and 300 from Boston. But Captain Zimmerman had chosen an airport he knew. A lot of times when you're having a problem, you would rather be dealing with an issue where you're much more familiar with the airport because that relieves a little stress on you. This is an initial problem. He's sitting there, he's looking up there, and he's trying to think, well, I've got smoke here. Now, what does it mean? Let's see, where, where are we? where's the closest place I can go to that I can talk to a Swiss air mechanic? Boston. Swiss Air 111 Center. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, go ahead. Would you prefer to go into Halifax? Or is we better put the mask on? Uh, stand by. Realizing their location, Zimmerman decided Halifax was now the best option. Affirmative, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. We prefer Halifax from our position. Swiss Air 111 Roger, proceed direct to Halifax to send now to flight level 290. Level 290 to Halifax, Swiss Air 111 Heavy. A British Airways pilot in the area offered the crew what little help he could. Swiss Air 111 Heavy from Speedbird 214. I can give you the Halifax weather if you like. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, uh, we have the uh, oxygen masks on. Uh, go ahead with the weather. It's the 300 Zulu weather. Was Swiss Air 111 commenced its descent to below 30,000 feet. The pilots calm and in control. It would take about 20 minutes to reach Halifax. Over. Roger, Swiss Air 111 Heavy, we copy 2980. Swiss Air 111, you're cleared to 10,000 feet, and the Halifax altimeter is 2980. Swiss Air 111 Heavy, 2980 at 10,000 feet. And Swiss Air 111, can you tell me what your fuel on board is? Uh, stand by for this. Speedbird 1506. Tusky listing out. Speedbird 1506, roger. The controller signed off with another aircraft. His jurisdiction was high altitude flights. As Swiss Air was on descent to Halifax, he hands over responsibility to Bill Pickrell. At that point, uh, everything was normal. Uh, I, I gave the pilot an initial descent and uh, he requested to level off at an intermediate altitude to get the cabin in order for the landing, which I took to mean that they needed to pack away dinner trays and uh, things like that. It was an indication to me that uh, uh, while his situation was unusual, uh, that uh, they weren't considering it as uh, an emergency at that time. Watch your speed, Stefan. Don't descend too fast. Roger. Captain. Now we have smoke in the cockpit here. Have the uh, cabin crew prepare for landing. We'll be setting down in Halifax in about 20 minutes. I'm about to start the checklist here. Yes, Captain Zimmerman. Zimmerman had two checklists for smoke in the cockpit. To complete both would take 20 minutes. This was Swiss Air Company policy. In the meantime, Love continued the descent into Halifax. Stefan, I'll need you to handle the radio while I do this checklist, all right? 119er, point two for the Swiss Air 111 Heavy. 
Swiss Air 111 was now at about 25,000 feet. Pickerel advises them to descend to 3,000. But First Officer Love said he'd rather fly at 8,000 until the passenger cabin was cleared. Their attitude underscored the sense of control in the cockpit. From my point of view, it uh, gave all initial appearances that it should be a fairly straightforward operation, that uh, assuming that uh, everything happened normally, the aircraft uh, would require a minimum of handling to uh, uh, lead them into Halifax. Swiss Air 111, you can uh, descend to three, level off at an intermediate altitude if you wish, just advise. That Pickerel was concerned the plane was not coming down fast enough. It appeared that the aircraft uh, might have been a little bit high, and uh, I wanted to ensure that the pilots were aware of how uh, far they were from the airport, how many miles they had to fly, so that they could uh, judge their own descent and make their decision about what they wanted to do. Roger, at the time we descend to 8,000 feet, and we are clear at any time to 3,000 feet. I keep you advised. Okay, can I vector you uh, to set up for runway 06 at Halifax? Uh, Roger, vector for six will be fine. Swiss Air 111, heavy. Swiss Air 111, Roger, turn left, heading of uh, 030. Left, heading 030 for the Swiss Air 111, heavy. Captain Zimmerman needed information for the unfamiliar airfield but his flight bag was out of reach. He summoned the flight attendant to help. You held me, Captain. For two minutes now. I need that flight bag there. It's got the approach charts for Halifax. <clears throat> okay, get back to your crew. Yes, Captain. The chief flight attendant notified passengers that the flight was being diverted. There was no panic. The plane was flying normally, and there was no sign of smoke in the cabin. Swiss Air 111, the localizer frequency is 109 or decimal niner. You've got 30 miles to fly to the threshold. Uh, we're going to need more than 30 miles. But still at more than 20,000 feet, Swiss Air 111 was too high to make a landing in just 30 miles. The frequency is a 109er decimal niner for the localizer. Okay, Roger, 109er point niner. And uh, we are turning left, heading uh, north, Swiss Air 111 heavy. And we've got to dump fuel. Agreed. So far, communications from Swiss Air had been calm. Still, Moncton Center initiated emergency efforts at Halifax Airport. Preparing ground crews for an emergency, Pickerel sought information from the pilots. souls on board and your fuel on board, please, for emergency services. Roger. At this time, fuel on board is two, three, zero tons. We have to dump some fuel. May we do that in this area during descent? Pickerel was surprised to learn so late that Swiss Air 111 needed to dump fuel. At that point, it became more of a complicated situation. In fact, with every transmission after that, it became more and more complicated. Pickerel considered his options for a safe place that wouldn't take the aircraft too far from Halifax. He decided to direct the plane over St. Margaret's Bay, about 30 miles from the airport. The other choice, uh, if he had said he needed to stay close, was to uh, start the aircraft in a, a, a right-hand turn to uh, set him up for any of the other runways. I had to keep him flying in a, in a circle or a constant track so that he wouldn't fly back into his own fuel, which would have been uh, not good. Dumping fuel is standard procedure. 
a fully fueled passenger jet is too heavy and could break up on landing. Are you able to take but co-pilot Love wondered if, given their situation, they might forgo the regulations. They want us to turn to the south. Should we just forget about dumping and just land? No, dump it. Okay, we are able for a left or right turn to the south in order to dump. I initiated the vector back toward St. Margaret's Bay to start him in that direction. It indicated to me that, again, uh, it wasn't uh, a critical situation on board, that in fact he did have time to be able to go back and uh, dump his fuel over the water. Swiss Air 111, uh, roger. Turn left, heading of uh, 200 degrees, and advise me when you're ready to dump. It will be about 10 miles before you're off the coast. We will still be within about 25 miles of the airport. Roger, we are turning left, 200. In that case, we are going to descend to only 10,000 feet in order to dump the fuel. Roger, maintain 10,000. I'll advise you when you're over the water. It will be very shortly. Roger. While Zimmerman continued with his checklist, Love accidentally transmitted to Bill Pickrell in Moncton. Are you in the emergency checklist for air conditioning smoke? Yes. Uh, Swiss Air 111, say again, please. Uh, sorry, that was not for you. Swiss Air 111 was asking internally. OK. Airspeed is decreasing below 306. Level off speed here. Let's fly the plane as you see that stuff on. Swiss Air 111, continue left heading 180. You'll be off the coast in about 15 miles. Left heading 180, roger. Swiss Air 111 and maintaining at 10,000 feet. Roger. Cabin bus off. Cabin bus off, Roger. The cabin bus switch knocked out all the lighting in the cabin. It was an indication for the passengers that something was wrong, but hardly alarming. Ladies and gentlemen, we have temporarily lost the lights in the cabin. Please remain calm. The crew will be coming around with flashlights to assist in landing. Despite a cockpit filled with smoke, there was still no trace in the passenger cabin. You will be staying within about uh, 35, 40 miles of the airport if you have to get back to the airport in a hurry. OK, that's fine with us. Please tell us when we can start to dump the fuel. Suddenly, the aircraft sent out a warning that the smoke was a sign of a more serious problem. Autopilot disconnect. Copy that. Autopilot disconnect. Swiss Air 111. The autopilot disconnected because the plane's computers sensed erratic readings. In the next 90 seconds, those readings went haywire. 11,000 and 9,000 feet. Swiss Air 111, you can block between 5,000 and 12,000 if you wish. One by one, the instruments failed. The calm in the cockpit dissolved. Copy that. We are clear between 12 and 5,000 feet. We are declaring emergency now. Swiss Air 111 at time 0124. Then the two pilots spoke simultaneously. Combined with other distractions in the control room, Pickerel was unable to hear a critical transmission. Love's declaration that they must land immediately. We are dumping fuel now. We must land immediate. Swiss Air 111, just a couple more miles. I'll be right with you. Roger that. And we're declaring emergency now. Swiss Air 111. Missing this transmission is a moment Bill Pickrell relives today. I'm not sure that it's a feeling that you can adequately describe. I recall reviewing the events of that night a thousand times to determine if there was something additionally that I could have done or if there was uh, some mistake that I might have made or was there any way that I contributed to this and eventually I was able to come to the point of realization that there wasn't anything that I could have done uh, that everything that could have was done now there was nothing to do but wait Thirty seconds after declaring an emergency, the pilots of Swiss Air 111 faced an inferno. All my screens are down. I'm flying on standby instruments, maintaining 300. 
Swiss Air 111. You are cleared to commence your fuel dump on that track and advise me when your dump is complete. Soon after I gave him authorization to commence the fuel dump, um, there was no acknowledgement. Um, initially, I wasn't concerned by that because I considered that he was probably doing the fuel dump, he was reviewing a checklist, he was busy doing things, and as per our training, we're told not to bother the pilots in those kinds of situations. Swiss Air 111 check, you are cleared to start the fuel dump. There was no further communication from the aircraft. Six minutes later, residents of Peggy's Cove heard a devastating explosion. No one knew what had happened to 229 people after six minutes of silence. It was probably one of the most helpless feelings that any individual can have, not being able to do anything but just sit and watch the target and hope that it would turn back toward the airport. And of course it didn't. The following morning, would-be rescuers glimpsed the terrible remains of Swiss Air 111. Only one body was discovered intact. In Geneva, Ian Shaw had a premonition about his 23-year-old daughter, Stephanie. That night, the night on which she was due to return, for reasons I can't explain even now, I was restless and I was disturbed, and um, I uh, slept early and woke uh, while my wife was still awake and asked her if she had had news of Stephanie. No, she had not, but she didn't expect to have news of Stephanie. We knew she was coming on that flight and that she would certainly expect me to be at the airport to fetch her in the morning. I awoke uh, around 6 Geneva time and on television there was a report of the crash of Swiss Air 111. And I knew instantaneously that we had lost our daughter. Air traffic controller Bill Pickrell was in shock. It's a strange experience. Um, I'm not sure that I can adequately express the feelings, but it's... Um, you work to, to provide a service and you, uh, you read about aircraft flying into a mountain or ending up in a swamp in some distant country, but you never expect that it's going to happen in your backyard. And when it does, it's... Uh, Kind of a lonely experience, I guess, in one sense. The Transportation Safety Board of Canada launched what would become the largest disaster investigation in the nation's history. They only knew Swiss Air 111 experienced a cockpit fire, but what caused it remained a mystery. Well, this accident was a challenging one to investigate in that initially, of course, we had to recover the aircraft from about 55 meters of water, around 185 feet. Of course, it was also in many pieces. Uh, as it turns out, it was in a couple of million pieces. So that was the initial challenge. And then after that, of course, uh, when you have so many pieces, 
You need to de determine which are the relevant ones and what are these pieces telling you about what happened and why. The TSB embarked on a five-stage plan. First, divers were deployed to survey the wreckage. They discovered that the plane was smashed into millions of pieces. But as the autumn weather worsened, the risks to divers increased. At this rate, the salvage would take years to complete. Stage two. With help from the United States Navy, remote operated vehicles began a more detailed search. The ROVs helped investigators survey the site. But the question remained, how to recover tiny pieces of twisted metal from the bottom of the sea? We have to go through little bits of airplanes, little pieces. In Swiss Air, we've had about two million pieces of airplane, and we pretty much almost had to look at them all because we had to discredit certain things, terrorists, uh, bombs, various other types of faults. The TSB's investigators finally got the breakthrough they've been seeking, the black boxes. Recordings of cockpit and computer data told investigators that everything on the plane was working perfectly until the last few minutes. When the crew declared the pan, 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 that they had smoke in the cockpit, after going through all of these parameters, uh, we found no anomalies or no problems in any of that flight data that suggested there was a problem with the aircraft. So this led us to believe that the crew had a relatively operational aircraft. Aside from the, the smoke in the cockpit that they noted, uh, everything else appeared to be working fine. And uh, as they were making their plan to, uh, to send the aircraft, they experienced a series of systems failures that were in rapid succession and exponential. Copy that, autopilot disconnect. Swiss Air 111, we must fly manually now. Mike Poole's CVR team then faced a serious setback. The last six minutes on both flight recorders were missing. You're losing systems rapidly on the airplane in that 90 second period that things are happening very fast. And the last thing we, one of the last things we know about was the two recorders went offline. So the fire has uh, presumably breached the lines, breached the, uh, breached the sources to these recorders and has stopped them. With the failure of the black boxes, investigators were no closer to learning how or where the fire started on Swiss Air 111. Stage three, barges were deployed to scour the seabed for evidence. One by one, sad remnants of the airplane reached the surface. Her engines were recovered. Then the landing gear. These were among the largest pieces of Swiss Air 111 to be recovered. The rest were mere fragments, dredged up in a painfully slow process. Stage four, a nearby military hangar provided a makeshift lab for the growing team of forensic investigators. Representatives from the American NTSB, Boeing, Swiss Air, and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police joined in the search for answers. Pieces of Swiss Air 111 arrived by the truckload, organized into various categories for analysis. Soon the hangar was stacked to capacity with the biggest jigsaw puzzle in aviation history. All the investigators knew for sure was that an initially small cockpit fire suddenly turned to catastrophe. The team sorted through nearly 155 miles of wiring retrieved from the wreckage of Swiss Air 111. Here, the first real clue, evidence of electrical arcing. Scorch marks on metal revealed that the source of the fire was in the back of the cockpit, 
directly behind the first officer. By examining the aircraft's wiring plans, investigators found a likely suspect, the entertainment system in first class. The system had some major deficiencies. It was getting very hot. It drew a lot of power. And uh, thereby, for example, raising the cabin, uh, cabin temperature uh, considerably, because it was always running. They did not install a simple off switch, nor did they install appropriate cooling systems to cool the system down. The TSB's investigators finally thought they had the breakthrough they'd been seeking. Our report indicates that there was a design flaw in the way the in-flight entertainment network installed in the first class and business class uh, sections of the aircraft were installed, uh, integrated into the electrical system of the airplane. When Captain Zimmerman threw the cabin bus switch, all power to the cabin should have been switched off. But the entertainment system remained on, overheating. If you'd ask most pilots, they would say, well, if I push the cabin butt switch, it's going to turn off the things behind the cockpit. It's going to isolate that electrically for me so that I don't have to worry about that and that I can just concentrate on those things that might affect me flying the airplane. Well, as it turns out, that this switch was kind of bypassed in, in this case for this IFAN or, or entertainment system. Swiss Air immediately disabled the entertainment systems on the rest of its fleet and the US National Transportation Safety Board ordered an inspection of cockpit wiring on all MD-11s. Unfortunately, this simple solution proved insufficient. By the time that cabin switch was turned off, the fire was well underway, and uh, so that had no real um, bearing on the, the initiation or propagation of the fire in the Swiss Air 111 aircraft. But investigators determined that the problem with the entertainment system alone could not have brought down Swiss Air 111. The search for answers continued. Stage five. Undaunted, the TSB reconstructed the MD-11 from the wreckage. A wireframe mock-up they called the jig provided a spine for placing tiny pieces back where they once belonged. The reconstruction revealed that the fire spread with alarming speed from the cockpit back into the first-class galleys. Some metal showed heat damage from temperatures as high as 600 degrees centigrade. As the investigation continued, some argued that the actions of the pilots may have contributed to the disaster. Some experts charged that Zimmerman and Love's by the book approach may have cost them their lives. Was asking internally. Some operators emphasized in a very early stage, land as soon as possible, and then if you have time, go into the checklist. Others uh, said, here's the checklist, and at the end of the checklist, if that doesn't help, then land as soon as possible. Pretty contradictory to basic flying instructions where Student pilots uh, learned at a very early stage that whenever you have smoke, you have a fire, and fire means land as soon as possible. Emergency light switch on. Emergency light switch on. Unfortunately, in this case, the way the checklist was written, it didn't identify that now start towards the divert. It started more on, let's try to see if we can solve the problem. And. Uh, so now, all of a sudden, you're taking on a problem that just kind of crept up on you. You weren't expecting it. Uh, we're going to need more than 30 miles. But the TSB considered the timeline. Investigators determined that Swiss Air 111 would not have made Halifax Airport under any circumstances. There just wasn't enough time. In our calculation, uh, we uh, showed that starting at the ideal descent point from 33,000 feet, uh, which was uh, at about uh, 10, 14 p.m. that night. It would take some 13 minutes to get the airplane onto the ground, which would take us to 10, 27 p.m. By 
1024, the systems in the aircraft were starting to deteriorate. So we believe that under these circumstances, uh, the crew would not have been able to successfully land the airplane under those conditions with the amount of time that they had. Whatever caused the fire on Swiss Air, it happened at a lethal speed. The mystery remained. A year passed, then another ambitious operation began. The TSB hired a sophisticated Dutch salvage ship, Queen of the Netherlands. The vessel has a gigantic vacuum system, capable of dredging even the tiniest pieces of Swiss Air 111 from the ocean floor. A mixture of seawater, silt and aircraft were pumped into the ship's hold. This cargo was then pumped into a specially constructed reservoir on shore. When the water drained away, investigators found another million pieces of the aircraft. Any one of them may have held the clue to what caused the catastrophic fire. The painstaking sorting once again resumed. Finally, after 15 months, they found what they'd been seeking, a single faulty wire. We looked at all of the possible sources of uh, heat that might start a fire in that area. And in this instance, um, we did uh, discover a wire that uh, arced in that way. And right next to it was some very flammable material called uh, metallized polyethylene terephthalate covering material that uh, covers the insulation blankets. This polyethylene insulate, which lined the MD-11, is common on commercial airlines worldwide. It has passed the industry's flammability tests that require materials to self-extinguish after a reasonable period of time. The investigation now took an abrupt turn. Instead of seeking the cause of the fire, the TSB now focused on the flammable materials that fueled it. This thermal acoustical material that was in this aircraft was very flammable, even though it passed a test. It does sustain and it does propagate flame. So this investigation did focus on the flammability of materials and the requirement to reassess the criteria that is used to certify materials, not just thermal acoustical insulation blanket material, but also other materials that goes into aircraft, much of it in hidden areas. Investigators now had their answer. A wire arced in a closed space behind the cockpit. The arc ignited the insulation, which in turn lit other materials, such as foams and plastics. The pilots could not sense how quickly the fire intensified. But 14 minutes after they declared pan, 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 the fire disabled all electronics in the cockpit. The black boxes went dead. A forensic examination also shed light on the desperate final minutes in the cockpit. Love was in his seat. Captain Zimmerman was not, likely fighting the fire and probably dead before impact. The uh, first officer was probably trying to find a place where he could put this big airplane. Um, he just didn't have a lot going for him. He didn't have a lot of instrumentation left. And I'm sure he was looking for something, some indication that would give him an idea of where he could put the airplane down, maybe even ditch the airplane. What is known is that the first officer was in his seat, whether he was uh, unconscious, conscious, maybe had severe degree burns on his skin. It's not known. We know the captain was not in his seat, so very likely he was trying to fight the fire. That the checklists were found uh, molten together, the pages, 
indicates that they were used to fight a fire. At 10.30 Halifax time, Love shut down engine two. Investigators determined that he probably received a warning the engine was on fire. Chillingly, it proved that Love was alive a minute before impact. They could not determine whether the passengers were aware of the fire, at least until the very final moments. There were traces found of soot and smoke extending as much far to the business class overhead area. Whether the passengers have smelled the smoke, it's not known. Uh, DNA analysis showed that they had no residue in their body. The aircraft hit the water with a force of 350 Gs. The TSB spent four and a half years and 40 million US dollars analyzing the wreckage of Swiss Air 111, the largest air disaster investigation in Canada's history. Their conclusion? Flammable materials do not belong on commercial aircraft. The rate of progression in this airplane, I think, surprised us and surprised uh, others. Uh, and uh, that's why we emphasize, again, the importance of um, raising the bar on the flammability standards for materials used in airplanes. Ian Shaw waited four years for the report to reveal the fatal flaw that took the life of his daughter. The truth has not diminished his anger at Swiss Air. There has to be accountability. If you are involved in wrongdoing, you must be held accountable. And you must declare your sense of respons responsibility. Otherwise, you are hiding. And you are hiding, in this case, behind the flag of Switzerland. I think it's unbelievable. In the aftermath, Swiss Air decided to remove the flammable insulate from its entire fleet. They also made changes to checklist procedure, reducing response time in a cockpit smoke emergency. Swiss Air did something very interesting. They modified their entire Swiss Air MD-11 fleet. According to all these findings, they built in cameras and smoke detectors, even in, into hidden areas, where pilots have a little TV monitor and they can see whenever there is a smoke warning, which makes them all help gain time. And that's the most important when you have the case of, when you have a fire. But plagued with financial problems, the mighty Swiss Air shocked the industry when it declared bankruptcy in October 2001. The flammable insulation that set Swiss Air ablaze remains in two-thirds of commercial airplanes today, but not for very much longer. The metallized polyethylene terephthalate material has been essentially banned from aircraft, and the criteria to certify that kind of material for use in airplanes has been worked on. It has not been put into law as yet, but uh, we look forward to that being done, so the criteria is more stringent. The US Federal Aviation Administration has given a deadline of 2005 to remove the material from all commercial aircraft. This major overhaul is designed to ensure that what took place on Swiss Air 111 will never happen again. The industry is trying to remove it, but it's, I don't think they're removing it um, as quickly necessary as they could. There's always that battle. How expensive is it to do something that's replacement, or are you going to replace it in an airplane you're going to throw away in another couple of years? We have to live within certain economic realities. For Ian Shaw, losing his daughter so suddenly and violently has left a permanent emotional scar. He left his wife and his wealth behind in Geneva and now runs a modest restaurant in Nova Scotia in view of the sea where his daughter died. Why would I come here to this particular point in Nova Scotia? A lot of people 
have said, oh yes, we fully understand you want to be close to your daughter and, and um, the point where the plane crashed. That is no part of my being here. Swiss Air um, ripped out of me any possibility of proximity to my daughter. I found a comfort in the awareness of the presence of the eternal ocean, the ocean which has been going backwards and forwards for many, many, many thousands, millions of years. I came here because I had to. Um, I, I can't give a fully rational declaration to you of why I came here. I can only say to you, I am in the right place for the wrong reasons. Deadly explosion rocks an airliner flying at 10,000 meters. A bomb has exploded on board. Bravo, Oscar, Mike, bravo. The blast kills a passenger and cripples the plane. The crew struggles to save 293 lives. The bombing sets in motion an international manhunt. While the terrorist prepares to strike again. We are in an emergency. On December the 11th, 1994, Philippine Airlines Flight 434 is two hours into the second leg of a routine flight from Manila to Tokyo. An unsuspecting passenger is sitting on a ticking bomb. The explosion on board cripples the flight control system. Unless the pilot can regain control, the jumbo jet may crash into the Pacific Ocean. This is Philippine Airlines 434. A bomb has exploded on board. Bravo, Oscar, Mike, bravo. The bombing is a frightening new development by a terrorist on the cutting edge of science. The way that the, the timing device was hidden inside the Casio watch um, just made the whole, the whole thing very uh, concealable and, uh, and very worrisome. But this is more than the hunt for a terrorist bomber. This is a story of how investigators make a shocking discovery. The explosion on PAL 434 is only a test for an attack on American carriers an attack that would dwarf every other terrorist atrocity at the time. It's before sunrise on December the 11th, 1994. While most inhabitants of this city of a million and a half have a few more hours to sleep, 26-year-old Amaldo Forlani makes an early start. Forlani is not his real name. It's the alias he's chosen for today's mission. He's actually from Pakistan, not Italy. He is putting his latest invention through an important test. Everything must go like clockwork. In his line of work, there's no room for error. He is a highly skilled terrorist bomb builder. He packs the liquid explosive bomb very carefully. From his apartment downtown, it takes less than 30 minutes to get to the airport.
He arrives in plenty of time for his 5 a.m. flight with Philippine Airlines. Before he can board, the bomber must outwit airport security screening procedures. He's designed the components of his bomb to pass undetected by X-ray and metal detection equipment. Or so he hopes. He bought the ticket as Armaldo Forlani. He's a skilled forger, and he has made himself a fake Italian passport with that identity. If his cover is blown, his career as a globe-trotting terrorist is over. Having successfully got the bomb through airport security, he boards his Philippine Airlines flight. The final destination of PAL 434 is Tokyo, but there's a stopover in the Philippine resort town of Cebu, over 550 kilometers to the south of Manila. This is as far as the bomber is flying today. That's 10,000 feet, and weather's still looking clear. Thanks, Dex. Let me get you autopilot. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is your Captain Ed Reyes speaking. Welcome aboard Flight 434, flying south from Manila to Cebu and continuing onward to Narita Airport, Tokyo. Flight 434 is under the command of Captain Ed Reyes, a former Air Force pilot who's been flying for Philippine Airlines for nine years. And our estimated arrival time is now 5.45. The first leg of the flight is fairly empty. Passengers are scattered around the jumbo jet's 400 seats. After takeoff, the bomber is able to move. He chooses seat 26K, located directly over the center fuel tank in some 747s. The cabin is tended by stewardess Maria de la Cruz. She flies domestic routes and has worked for Philippine Airlines for one year. Can I get you some juice or coffee? Juice, please. Now the bomber must find a vacant lavatory to assemble the explosive device. Arming the bomb only takes minutes, but requires total concentration. The final step is setting the timer so it will explode in four hours' time, long after he leaves the plane. He hides the bomb in the life jacket pocket underneath his seat. He then changes seats. When she returns, Maria de la Cruz notices that the roving passenger has moved seats again. She will remember that he left his breakfast untouched and that the rest of the flight passed uneventfully. As Philippine Airlines Flight 434 begins its final approach into Cebu, more passengers are getting ready to board the aircraft that will take them onwards to Tokyo. Cabin crew, prepare for landing. Cabin doors to automatic. PAL 434 lands in Cebu at 6.50 a.m and several of the passengers disembark, including the terrorist with the alias Amaldo Forlani. Bye-bye, thank you. Maria de la Cruz will also leave flight 434. A new cabin crew will take over for the four and a half hour flight to Tokyo.
256 new passengers board the 747 that arrived from Manila. Many of the passengers in this cabin are Japanese. Among them is 24-year-old engineer Haruki Ikigami. He's looking forward to getting home to Tokyo after his first trip overseas. Airport congestion delays the departure by 38 minutes, but the timer on the bomb under seat 26K continues to tick. Eight thirty a.m., December the eleventh, nineteen ninety-four. All passengers for Philippine Airlines Flight four three four are now on board for the leg to Tokyo. None of them is aware that two hours earlier, a terrorist planted a time bomb under one of their seats. Steward Fernando Bayot is assisting passengers in the forward cabin on this four and a half hour flight. At 8.38, PAL 434 is cleared for takeoff. On the flight deck, Captain Ed Reyes is assisted by First Officer Jaime Herrera and Systems Engineer Dexter Comendador. Reyes and Comendador are both former Air Force pilots. Haruki Ikigami is seated in 26K, the seat occupied by the bomber earlier on the first leg of Flight 434 from Manila to Cebu. Several passengers in this cabin are co-workers, traveling with a Japanese tour group, including Keisuke Aoki and Masaharu Moshizuki. After takeoff, everything seemed normal. We were flying at 10,000 meters. I was reading a magazine, then the meal was served. After eating, I went to sleep. 31-year-old Yukihiko Sui stayed up all night on the last day of his trip, and he's ready to nap after breakfast. He's sitting in row 27, one row behind the seat vacated by the bomber four hours earlier. I expect we'll be landing at Narita Airport in two hours' time. Two hours into the flight, PAL 434 is cruising on autopilot 10,000 meters above Minami Daito Island, southern Japan. To ease the pilot's workload, the autopilot remains on throughout the flight, keeping the aircraft on a constant heading at altitude. God forgive me. That was my inner uh, uh, thought, you know. God forgive me. I think I'm going to die now. Then after that, I have to do what I had to do. Oh, I've lost control. I have control. Dex, check the presentation loss. Be prepared. Check the QRH for. Although the autopilot instantly corrects the aircraft's bank to the right, the effect of the blast is far from over. There was a loud bang which woke me up. I could feel the plane expanding from the pressure. I saw smoke as well as debris falling like powder. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay in your seat. The injured people were trying to get away from the area where the bomb was. I stood up and saw that a lot of people were bleeding. I thought my life was over. Stay in your seat, please. The cabin crew's first priority is to stop passengers leaving their seats. Yukihiko Usui is sitting in the row directly behind the explosion. Both his legs are badly wounded. Steward Fernando Bayot moves him away from the blast site. <laughs> Please sit down and fasten your seatbelt. 
Bayot now turns his attention to Haruki Ikigami. He has been swallowed by the smoking hole where C26K used to be. I saw this man, only his head and his arms were peering out of the hole, so I tried to uh, pull him out. After the struggle to lift him out, Bayot realizes that part of the lower half of Ikigami's body is missing. Within a couple of minutes, he dies. The cabin crew do not want Ikigami's death to panic passengers, so they pretend to minister to him. Bayot then reports to the captain. Oh, captain. OK. Keep the passengers calm. Make sure they stay in their seats. There's been an explosion in row 26, one dead and several injured, and the cabin's full of smoke. There's a hole in the floor. Go inspect the damage, Dex. Yes, sir. Reyes' first concern is that the blast could make a hole in the aircraft's skin. This would lead to sudden depressurization in the cabin and necessitate an emergency descent. There was a huge gaping hole uh, beside her, and if a small tear in the skin of the aircraft was, uh, if there were a hole there, it most probably would open up and then pull us out of the aircraft. When I saw that there was no damage to the outer skin, I went up and reported to the captain while we assumed that the pressurization system would hold. Immediately after the explosion, the co-pilot's steering wheel slams to the right and the aircraft banks in the same direction. The autopilot immediately corrects the deviation but soon Reyes discovers that the autopilot steering system is another victim of the blast. Then I said, OK, I'm going to try to turn the airplane using the autopilot, but there was no reaction whether I tried it to make it go down or up or left and right turns, no reaction. I said, now we have a problem. This is not Reyes' only problem. In the cabin, one of the injured passengers needs urgent medical attention. Tokyo is still two and a half hours away, and Reyes decides to try and land at Naha Airport on the island of Okinawa, located 74 kilometers to the west. He orders the co-pilot to make a mayday call. Yes, sir. Naha, pile 434, heavy declaring emergency. Explosion on board. We have casualties. Requesting emergency landing at Naha. We will need full emergency services on landing. Pile 434, Naha, please repeat. Say again. Naha, PAL 434, heavy declaring emergency. Explosion on board. We have casualties. Request emergency landing at Naha. We will need full emergency. Getting the Japanese air traffic controller to understand the emergency proves to be difficult. Naha, Naha, Naha. This is Philippine Airlines 434, flight level 330. A bomb has exploded on board. Bravo, Oscar, Mike, Bravo. Bomb explosion. Request emergency landing at Naha. And there was silence. Then the controller came in, another controller, an American. OK, Philippine 434, I'm taking over. The American air traffic controller is from an American base on Okinawa. Turn left, heading. No, I shot back. Uh, we cannot turn at this moment yet. We will tell you when we are starting to turn yeah. towards Naha. We have problems with our flight controls. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We will be making an early landing at Naha Airport in Okinawa. We'll be landing as soon as possible, so please remain in your seat with your seatbelt fastened. But landing at Naha is easier said than done. The autopilot is not responding to any of Reyes' commands, and PAL 434 is heading straight past Okinawa. Reyes must find a way to steer if he is to have any chance of landing safely. Uh. But disengaging the autopilot might result in losing what minimal control he still has over the aircraft. OK. Let's keep the seatbelt sign on. When we disengage the autopilot, we might lose control, so be ready. Since the autopilot won't react to any inputs that I make, I was scared if I disengage the autopilot, the aircraft might make a sudden 
bang to the right that we might not be able to control. At the count of three, I'll disengage. One, two, three. One, two, three, tuck. Nothing happened. And then there was, uh, we were relieved. I can't turn using the controls. <sighs> Looks like the explosion jammed the aileron. Dex, what's the QRH say about jammed ailerons? The QRH, or Quick Reference Handbook, is the pilot's bible that lists procedures that must be followed in emergency situations. Jammed flight controls. Use maximum force possible, including both pilots, if required. OK. That's force. <sighs> Reyes tries brute force to activate the ailerons, the panels on each wing which turned the aircraft. Since the explosion, he can only fly straight. <sighs> Not getting anything from the ailerons. Can't get off this heading. OK. Re-engage the autopilot. I work out our options. It's taking much longer to land than was announced. We were told it would only be 20 minutes, but it was really one hour before we landed. It was very frightening. Although they survived the bombing, passengers are now getting anxious about landing safely at Naha Airport. Since there was so much time before landing, I started writing a will. I wrote the will to my son, telling him to be strong. As PAL 434 looks like missing Naha Airport, Reyes comes up with another plan. We gotta turn. We'll have to use differential power. Disengage auto throttle, pull back three and four. Captain Reyes increases thrust to the engines on the left-hand side of the plane and reduces power to the engines on the right. Very slowly, the aircraft starts to circle right. He then lowers his speed to make a smaller radius turn. With guidance from air traffic control, Reyes hopes that the maneuver will eventually line up with the runway at Naha. So while we were descending on low speed, I tried to test the flight controls. And there, is, there are some little reactions the elevator is beginning to respond. Dex. The elevator is a control that makes the plane ascend and descend. 250 knots, flaps one, on speed. In order to land safely, Reyes will need at least minimal control over the elevator and rudder. As PAL 434 nears Naha, he continues to reduce his airspeed. Flaps 10. Flaps 10 set. Speed 225. Okay, she's turning. Sir, if we reduce our weight, we will be able to reduce our approach and landing speeds. Suggest we dump fuel. That's okay, we're Reyes orders the systems engineer to dump 36 tons of fuel. Five minutes, 20, pounds. Less fuel means less strain on landing gear and brakes at touchdown. Check. I was terrified when I saw the smoke trail behind each wing. I thought something must be burning and there would be another explosion. As the time to touch down gets closer, Reyes worries that the bomb may have done more as yet unknown damage to the aircraft. I'm not certain our landing gear will hold up. Strap yourself in. I'll the purser. So he talked to the head of the cabin crew and he said, we're not sure if the gears will go down. And in case the gears collapse while landing, be ready to evacuate. It's either you, you make it or you die. That's because you cannot do anything anymore. Runway in sight. With only minimal control over the aircraft, Reyes faces the most challenging landing of his career. <laughs> 10,000 meters above the Pacific Ocean on a flight from the Philippines to Tokyo, a terrorist bomb cripples the flight controls of a jumbo jet. As PAL 434 starts its final approach, the 292 people on board are pinning their hopes of survival on the skill of Captain Ed Reyes. I know all, everybody was scared. I, we, oh, we are all scared. I know that. Gear down. The gears were supposed to come down a few seconds, 
but that was the longest second <laughs> that uh, because we were waiting for the greens to come yeah. on take a long time it know? took a long time it was a long few seconds until it when it locked three greens sir okay. i'm disconnecting the autopilot and landing manually okay dex monitor my descent rate call altitude and speed flaps 30. okay 500 feet on course flaps 30 set help me with the elevator when i say push i want you to push Okay, 200, slightly left. Correcting. Push. 100. 50. 30. Power off. Pull. <clears throat> Your last uh, command was pull. Yeah. My last <laughs> command was pull. <laughs> I made sure that the throttles were closed because <laughs> he might give a go around and I would make sure that we would stay on the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain speaking. We'd like to thank you for your cooperation and your patience. Emergency crews are on their way. We'll try and get you out of here as soon as possible. Thank you. The Philippine Airlines 747 is now a crime scene under Japanese jurisdiction. As investigators from the Okinawa Police Department set out to solve the mystery of what happened, they turn their attention first to the dead man in C-26K. The forensic pathologist recovered 94 fragments embedded in Ikigami's buttocks by the explosion. He suffered severe internal injuries and massive loss of blood. But tragic as it was, the effects of the explosion could have been much worse. If the explosion had been sideways, it would have blown a hole in the plane and caused an air pressure problem. In a sense, it was good that the blast was vertical. But we have to remember the victim. He died to save the rest of us. Ikegami's body bore the brunt of the upward blast, but the explosion severed the steel cables in the ceiling that control the rudder and elevator. The charge also severed the co-pilot's control cable to the right aileron, one of the control surfaces on the wing which make an aircraft bank and turn. The downward force blew a hole in the floor and could have ignited the vapors in the center fuel tank, creating a catastrophic explosion. But by chance, on December the 11th, C-26K was not located above the tank. Fortunately for us, we took a different version, the SAS version of the 747 that day. And that specific seat for that version was two seats forward of the center tank. The Okinawa forensic investigators immediately start work collecting evidence from the bomb site. They begin with the largest fragments of debris and then systematically work down until the smallest particles are retrieved by vacuum cleaner. Japanese investigators cannot identify the bomb's detonator. But by separating out bits of metal, plastic and electrical wire that do not belong to the plane, components of the bomb are pieced together. one forensic investigator is able to identify the bomb's timer. By reconstituting dozens of burnt fragments, he discovers it's a modified digital wristwatch. Investigators also discover that one of the bomb's 9-volt batteries is only sold in the Philippines. It's another clue that suggests that the bomber could be based there. Philippine National Police Deputy Chief Sonny Raisin is on the case. 
the later part of 1994, we already started to receive information, intelligence reports, that there were uh, Middle Eastern personalities that uh, were here already in the Philippines. On the night of January the 6th, 1995, almost four weeks after the bombing of PAL 434, the Philippine police get a lucky break. In his Manila apartment, the PAL 434 bomber has enlisted the help of an accomplice to mass produce his new undetectable bomb. An attempt to burn off chemicals gets out of hand. Acrid smelling smoke spills out of the apartment. It attracts the attention of the doorman who comes to investigate. What's going on? Sorry, sorry. Uh, we, we're playing with some fireworks, but it's okay. We put them out and we have all the windows open inside and we keep the door closed. It will be fine, okay? Uh, you all open the door. No, no. If we open the door, the smoke comes in the hallway. We keep it closed to go out the window, okay? It's okay. It's okay. Until the smoke dissipates, the bombers decide to wait outside the apartment. The doorman isn't convinced by their playing with fireworks story, and he calls the fire department and the police. By the time the firemen come, the smoke is gone, and they leave after a quick check. The bomber now realizes he's left a very sensitive item in the apartment and he persuades his friend to retrieve his laptop. He was uh, too clever a guy to come back and uh, expose himself because all along he knew that uh, that would be too risky for him to go back and be caught. The bomber's fear of getting caught is justified. Once police inspector Ada Farascal learns that they're from Pakistan, she insists on seeing their room for herself. The police in Manila are on high alert due to a planned visit by the Pope in a few days. What Inspector Farascal finds confirms her worst fears about the intentions of the tenants. You! Stop! The shot distracts the apprentice and he trips over a fallen palm tree. But the cop discovers he has no handcuffs. The doorman improvises with the drawstrings of his windbreaker. In the meantime, the bomber vanishes. One of the first senior officers to arrive at his apartment is Sonny Raisin. Incident at uh, Doña Josepa apartment uh, was the breakthrough in uh, opening our eyes that uh, the Al-Qaeda terrorist cell was already operating here in the Philippines. The Philippine National Police know they've stumbled onto something big, and they inform Interpol, Scotland Yard, and the FBI. When news of the raid reaches the Joint Terrorism Task Force in New York, it immediately grabs the attention of FBI Special Agent Frank Pellegrino, for two years, he has been hunting a terrorist called Ramzi Youssef, and it looks as if this might be his man. Well, he was always our focus since 93. Right. I mean, at the time, that was the, you know, he was the biggest fugitive around. As Philippine police comb through the apartment, they begin to find more evidence tying Youssef to the bombing of PAL 434. There was a similarity between the watches that were found in the apartment and the type of uh, watch that was used in, in Okinawa. But putting together that, that watch, that was the watch that was on the bomb uh, on that flight 434, and identifying those pieces eventually as a Casio watch, you know, it was amazing. Yusef is a skilled forger. 
Investigators find several identification cards bearing various names and photos in each of which he looks quite different. One ID card is of particular interest. So almost there's a dig to us. This, you know, the ID card used the First World Trade Center bombing date as the date that the card was issued. So we knew right away it was, was Yosef that, was, that had been in the apartment. They knew chemicals. The chemical dictionary uh, was uh, a very well-used uh, item, uh, underlined, highlighted, uh, well-read uh, notations throughout the book, uh, something that he used quite often. And uh, you know, I don't remember the exact number. I think there might have been 100 latent prints found on that that belonged to him. They knew electronics. The way that the, the timing device was hidden inside the Casio watch um, just made the whole, the whole thing very uh, concealable and, uh, and very worrisome. The identification of the bomber of PAL-434 and the discovery of his bomb factory is very disturbing news for those responsible for airline passenger safety. Ramzi Youssef is an international terrorist who knows how to get his bombs past airport security. Bombs that are small, but if strategically located, can blow up a jumbo jet and kill not just one, but hundreds of people. And the bomber of PAL 434 is still on the loose. The Philippine National Police have stumbled on the hideout of an international terrorist. The FBI identify him as Ramzi Youssef, Evidence that Amaldo Forlani, the man who planted the bomb on PAL 434, is the same person as Ramzi Youssef, comes from the travel agent who sold him the Philippine Airlines ticket. Ramzi Youssef is just one of several aliases of a man who tops the FBI's most wanted list. An international terrorist with a $2 million bounty on his head. Youssef whose real name is probably Abdul Karim Basit, was born and raised in Kuwait, where his father worked as an engineer. It was there that he met the friend that he enlisted to help him in the Manila bomb factory. When he was 18, Youssef's family returned to their Pakistan homeland. Youssef married and had two children. Soon after returning home, his parents sent him to study in Britain. He was taking classes both in engineering and in uh, using the computer. So he definitely had some talent. In summer breaks from college in the late 1980s, Youssef returns to Pakistan. He puts his new engineering skills to use by teaching bomb making to militants in training camps near Peshawar, Pakistan. These camps are fertile ground for making contacts with militants worldwide. In September 1992, Youssef flies from Pakistan to New York to prepare for a major terrorist attack. On arrival at JFK, he presents a fake Iraqi passport and asks for political asylum from Saddam Hussein. The ploy works and he's allowed to enter the country. Six months later, on February the 26th, 1993, one of the largest homemade bombs in American history explodes in the garage below the World Trade Center, killing six people, injuring hundreds, and causing $500 million worth of damage. That night, Youssef is on a plane back to his home in Pakistan. He was an action figure. He wanted to keep doing things. Uh, he wasn't happy with the one success he had. 18 months after the World Trade Center attack, Youssef flies to Manila to fine-tune the bomb that he plants on PAL-434. According to Sonny Raisin, the Philippine capital suits him. Ramsey Youssef uh, loved to enjoy life. He, was a, he is a ladies' man. Uh, he associated himself with a lot of uh, girlfriends, and uh, he liked to party. He, he also drank a lot. See, and he enjoyed the life, terrorists. They are your normal day-to-day uh, -day people, the uh, guy next door. After the bombing of PAL 434, 
Youssef arranges for his childhood friend Abdul Hakim Murad to assist him in Manila. But on January the 6th, 1995, two weeks after his arrival, Murad is arrested and sent to the Philippine police headquarters for interrogation. It took 67 days to extract the details of how Youssef planted the bomb. My uh, impressions of him was that uh, he was uh, strong-willed. He was uh, determined. Uh, initially, he did not break down in uh, questioning. And uh, it was only when uh, the FBI team that came in and provided us with uh, additional information or pieces of the puzzle that uh, we did not have, that he started to talk. Tiny chemical traces of the explosive were found on PAL-434, and Murad eventually admits that Youssef uses liquid nitroglycerin that he stabilized and concealed in a bottle of contact lens solution. Murad also reveals that Youssef hid the bomb's potentially suspicious components in the heel of his shoes. Most airport security systems only detect metal above the ankles. I bet you he was cool as could be. He was somewhat uh, cavalier in his attitude toward these explosives and chemicals. To carry a container of nitroglycerin on, a, on an airplane, uh, you know, it would be a little nuts. Murad's confession provides details of Youssef's actions after he successfully got the bomb components past airport security. Can I get you some juice or coffee? Juice, please. Youssef designed the device so the innocent-looking components can be quickly transformed into a lethal bomb. Youssef has modified a digital wristwatch as the bomb's timer. This is wired to a detonator inside the bottle of nitroglycerin. Two 9-volt batteries provide an additional electric charge to the exposed filament of a light bulb that will spark the explosion. Youssef sets the alarm for four hours later, when he anticipates the plane will be flying high over the Pacific Ocean. Youssef plants the bomb in a life vest pouch under his seat, a place ground crews are unlikely to inspect during the stopover in Cebu. Soon after, he gets off the plane and disappears. Four hours later, the time bomb under seat 26K awakes the airline industry to a new kind of terrorism. Murad's confession confirms Pellegrino's suspicions. This is just the kind of sophisticated plot he has come to expect from Ramzi Youssef. But Pellegrino is still shocked by what Murad says next. PAL 434 was only a test, a dry run for a much larger terrorist plot that will kill thousands of airline passengers. A highly skilled terrorist, Ramzi Youssef, has already set off a new type of bomb on an aircraft. Now the FBI discovers Youssef wants to blow up more planes. And he continues to evade capture. FBI investigators find evidence of Youssef's meticulous planning on secret files on the laptop that he so desperately wanted his accomplice to retrieve. On the laptop computer found in the Youssef apartment building, was a file which laid out a plan 
for five individuals using code names, individuals not mentioned on the plan, to uh, board about three planes each, maybe two planes, a couple of people have three planes, uh, planting bombs on the planes, uh, and then uh, returning back to their home. Hoping when they planted the bombs and with the timing devices, if everything went well, uh, all bombs would go off within about a six hour time period. Uh, any more than one would have been, been an airline disaster. Um, so, you know, if they were 50% successful in their plan, I think it would have scared a lot of people for a long time. The file on Youssef's laptop reveals that the plan, codenamed Bojinka, is foiled with no time to spare. The bombing of 12 American planes is meant to kill 4,000 passengers. Youssef's campaign of terror against the airlines is scheduled to start less than two weeks after the bust of his bomb factory in Manila. By the time Pellegrino and the FBI team arrive in the Philippines, Youssef is long gone. So it was a worry and it was a, a missed opportunity. Um, but we, we also, on a lot of these fugitive type cases, uh, you know, we're all not that different and everybody goes home. Everybody needs to go home. And uh, so the investigation again would focus back uh, to Pakistan. The FBI immediately begin a publicity campaign in Pakistan, promoting their $2 million reward for assistance in arresting Youssef. The strategy works. Youssef's latest recruit for yet another airline bombing blows the whistle. On the day Youssef is due to leave his hotel in Islamabad, a Pakistani SWAT team moves in. In Yusuf's room are Delta and United Airlines flight schedules, as well as bomb components hidden in children's toys. Who are you? Do you have a warrant? The informer receives the $2 million bounty for the tip-off which prevents yet another airline attack. He was shocked. Did not think he would be, he would be caught. He had a certain confidence about him, and I didn't think he thought we'd ever catch up to him. Within hours of his capture, Youssef is extradited from Pakistan and put on a waiting US government plane. With the cooperation of the Japanese and Philippine governments, the FBI arranged for Youssef to stand trial in New York City for the PAL 434 bombing, as well as the earlier 1993 attack on the World Trade Center. In a convoy of federal and local patrol cars, Ramzi Ahmed Youssef was brought into New York City late Wednesday night, ending a worldwide manhunt. He was arrested Tuesday in Pakistan by Pakistani authorities and brought back by the FBI on a U.S. plane, then into custody with heavy security on the street in case of any terrorist attacks prompted by his arrest. At his trial a year later in New York's Southern District Court, Youssef decides to handle his own defense against the advice of the judge. He performs better than expected, but he is found guilty on all charges related to the bombing of PAL 434 and conspiring to bomb 12 American passenger planes. Youssef is also found guilty in a second trial for the World Trade Center bombing. In his final summing up, Youssef justifies his actions. Yes, I am a terrorist and proud of it. And I only support terrorism so long as it's against the United States government and against Israel, because you are more than terrorists. Although Pakistani, Youssef describes himself as Palestinian by choice. And he justifies the PAL 434 and World Trade Center bombings as punishment for a US foreign policy that favors Israel over Palestine. And hypocrites! For both crimes, he's sentenced to 240 years in prison. The judge recommends solitary confinement for life in the most secure prison in the United States, located in Florence, Colorado. It houses the country's most violent and dangerous prisoners, and it's where Youssef will spend the rest of his life, confined in a cell for up to 23 out of every 24 hours. 
we cannot uh, afford to uh, just sit down and uh, uh, count our victories with the arrest of uh, Ramsey Youssef. Somebody else has already replaced him and somebody else is already thinking of how to circumvent these uh, security measures that we put up. In the year following Youssef's attack on PAL 434, the Federal Aviation Administration certified a machine to detect explosives. Not one American carrier bought it. Only after 9-11 was a law passed that required U.S. airports to deploy explosive detection systems. But the most reliable models are expensive or too slow and still not widely employed. Well, they were still saying, you know, we have to be right 100% of the time. Terrorists only have to be right once. Although there hasn't been a successful airliner bombing since PAL 434, those who forget the past may be destined to revisit it.